Who was behind children's classics such as the Bobsy Twins, Nancy Drew, and the Hardy Boys? We'll discuss that today on Footnoting History. Hello, and welcome to Footnoting History. I'm your host, Elizabeth, and today we'll be discussing the Stratemeyer Syndicate and how it was behind such beloved works as the Bobsy Twins, Nancy Drew, and the Hardy Boys. Full disclosure, I've never actually read the Hardy Boys, and my sister was more of a fan of Nancy Drew than I was, but I grew up on the Bobsy Twins. The Christmas when I was about eight or nine years old, my mom bought me a collection of republished Bobsy Twin books. She had read them growing up, and wanted me to have a similar experience. To say that the books had some questionable language to a child in the 1980s, that's an understatement. Even I knew that it was wrong for the Bobsy's cook slash housekeeper, Dinah, to be described as a, quote, jolly fat colored woman, end quote. But the stories were mostly fun and innocent and reminiscent of another favorite series of mine, The Boxcar Children. And that's all we're going to say about The Boxcar Children in this podcast, because my tangent would be long. Yankee ingenuity can't explain everything, Gertrude Chandler Warner. There are plot holes. Okay, back to the Bobsy Twins. Well, I kept those hardcover classics, and now they've been given to my daughters. My husband and I have been reading them to the girls as bedtime stories, and again imbue this image of adorable domestic bliss with my husband reading aloud without paying attention to what he's saying, and discovering that he has just called the Bobsy's housekeeper Dinah a jolly fat colored woman. He literally sputtered, and then called me into the room the first time this happened. I believe since then he has changed the description, which repeats in all the books as per the formula, and he now refers to her just as a lovely woman. Oh, if only I were mining these books for terminology about race and size in the 1960s. But I'm not, so onward, friends. The Bobsy Twin series were actually first published in 1904. The books tell the stories of two sets of fraternal twins, Bert and Nan, age 12 in the stories I read, and the younger siblings, Freddie and Flossie, who were six. In the 1960s, the books were rewritten to include innovations, such as the car. But many plots were also completely redone, with the titles being kept the same. In fact, many of them were redone to take care of the previous issues with race or other questionable stereotypes. So again, what was acceptable in the 1960s, even after rewriting the past, Still not acceptable in the 1980s. Throughout the series, though, the core story of the Bobsies remains the same. They're an upper-class family. The father owns a lumber yard in the town of Lakeport, and the family always has disposable income. They go on some pretty fabulous vacations, dude ranches, the beach. They even decide in one book to buy a houseboat because it's available, and that's what you do when you own the lumber yard in 1960s America, apparently. You also hire the man you're buying the boat from to be your captain, as one does. And what did they do on these vacations, or even while hanging out in all-American Lakeport? They solved mysteries, of course. Isn't that the theme of so many early to mid-20th century classics of our childhood? Mysteries! Solved by children! Like us! And 12-year-old Bert never had a problem being taken seriously when calling the town's chief of police on a hunch. Is this starting to sound familiar? It should. Like the Bobsies, Frank and Joe Hardy and Nancy Drew were wealthy detectives, though teens, instead of children like Nan, Bert, Flossie, and Freddie. The Hardy boys and Nancy were always up for adventure and were always capable of purchasing an airline ticket on the spur of the moment to follow a clue. And if I sound jealous, yeah, I am. I am. And they were always taken seriously, and if anyone seemed to lack confidence in them or question their actions, then a quick word from their fathers quelled any lingering doubts. At this point, I now feel, instead of discussing size and race, that I should be discussing white privilege in children's literature. But again, not the topic of this podcast, although certainly an interesting conversation one could have. What I want to get at in this podcast is not so much the audience for these books and the lasting impressions they left on so many of us, but rather, who was behind these works? And the authors of these books certainly seem to know what children wanted to read about. Authors like Laura Lee Hope, who wrote the Bobsy Twin books. Franklin W. Dixon and his Hardy Boys. Carolyn Keene spoke to generations of young girls with her depiction of Nancy Drew, girl detective. Or did she? The answer is no. Wait, you ask me. You do, don't you? Is this a game of semantics? Is this a clever way of just revealing the pseudonyms or nom de plumes of the authors? No. 
Is this because all three of these works were rewritten and republished numerous times so that only really the initial authors were Hope, Keen, and Dixon? No, because there was no technical author. There never was a Hope or a Keen or a Dixon. Instead, these works were churned out by a group of men and women who worked for Edward Stratemeyer. Why Henry Ford himself couldn't have been more proud of the efficiency of the assembly line of the Stratemeyer Syndicate. Side note, I thought of this joke when I first learned about the Stratemeyer Syndicate, and then I read it in Megan O'Rourke's article, which I've linked to on our website, footnotinghistory.com, in our further reading. I'm not sure what this demonstrates, other than when one thinks of efficiency in assembly lines, Henry Ford springs to mind. But back to our discussion. Edward Stratemeyer was born during the middle of the American Civil War in that most prosaic of locations, Elizabeth, New Jersey. From an early age, Stratemeyer, son of German immigrants, loved to read and even owned a printing press as a teen from which he would print up papers for his friends with such riveting titles as Revenge or The Newsboy's Adventure. His father wasn't too impressed with his son's interests and for a long time Edward worked in his father's tobacco shop and kept at his hobby in private. Edward was a big fan of Horatio Alger's ragged riches stories of young men in late 19th century America who successfully seized the golden rings of the American dreams through hard work and one or two lucky breaks, and they would rise from humble beginnings to extreme wealth. Edward's stories usually followed a similar outline, and at age 26, he saw one published in a boys' magazine for $75, a princely sum. Eventually, Edward became editor of the journal Good News, in which Alger published his work. And that is Edward, who had already shown his willingness to work hard, had his lucky break. Well, for Edward, if not Alger. In 1898, when Edward was 46 years old, because one is never too old for a rags to riches ending, Alger contacted him and asked Edward to finish a story. Alger was too old and sick to do it himself. So Edward did that and more. Even after Alger died, he continued to finish half-written stories for the legendary American mythmaker. Edward's next leap up was after he saw the success of a former writer for his journal, Gilbert Patton's stories of Frank Merriwell, all-American boy hero, led the dime novel onslaught and demonstrated that not only was there a market for such books, there was a large one. Edward immediately published a set of works about the Rover Boys, and lo and behold, it was a runaway success as well. But Edward wasn't done, and he understood the market. Edward approached a publishing firm with his thoughts. First, the books would be hardbound, and therefore look more respectable to parents. They would also be more expensive, but at 50 cents, still within the realm of possibility for many boys. Next, they would be sold in sets of three in order to get the kids hooked on the stories and to make them faithful consumers. Publishers were nervous, but it worked, and it worked well. But those weren't Stratemeyer's best or most lasting ideas. No, he realized that he had a ready set of authors at his very fingertips. Men and women who had written for his children's journal and would gladly write whole books for better pay, even if their names never saw print. And so it began. Edward would write up a two-page outline of plot, send it off to one of his authors who would write a book of a specific length, including numbers of chapters and pages, and then send them back to Edward who would edit the whole work. It did not do for these freelancers, for in our terms that's what they were, to become too proprietary of what they had written, as Edward could easily, and often did, replace them. Edward owned all of the nom de plumes under which his books were written, and so they were never identified with either the man who conceived the idea, or the man or woman who executed them, but a seeming exemplar of respectability, a Carolyn Keene, a Frank W. Dixon, a Laura Lee Hope. Men and women that parents could put their confidence in not to lead their children astray. Stratemeyer's death in 1930 did nothing to slow down productivity. His daughter Harriet took over the syndicate. Doesn't it sound rather mob-like when you put it that way? What is it about the early 20th century and syndicates? Harriet even wrote many of the Nancy Drew books herself for a time. In 1960, as I mentioned, it was realized that the books needed to be updated, technology needed to be incorporated, some of the more racist or questionable storylines were purged, my mother, for example, remembers reading the story of Baby May, a foundling for whom the Bobsy twins were taxed with finding a family. I read the book. It was about a baby elephant named May and a mystery at the circus with which she traveled. However, as I mentioned at the top, some of the language which was changed in the 1960s is still problematic today, although it does offer an interesting evolution of how different groups have been described over the course of the 20th century. There's a dissertation somewhere in there, my friends. 
Perhaps it's already written. If so, please email us at footnotinghistory at gmail.com and we'll add it to the further reading. Speaking of further reading, if you go to our website, I've included a link to a blog which provides more in-depth details about each of the actual writers, or who we believe to be the actual writers, for many of these books. There, I hope I haven't disillusioned you too much. And if you want to look up some of your more favorite children's series from, say, the 80s, such as, oh, I don't know, the Babysitter's Club, you may also find yourself with similar reactions as it turns out that the authors only wrote a certain number and then others took over. Stratemeyer's Syndicate was a success and had a long and lasting influence on our children's books today. Feel free to comment on footnotinghistory.com, our Facebook page, or by Twitter to let us know which of these were your favorite books and why. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week! <laughs>